Welcome into this week's episode of the Think Deeper podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jack Wilkie, joined as always by my co-hosts, Joe Wilkie and Will Harib. Before we get into this week's episode, I wanted to apologize. Last week when we did the episode on pornography addiction, uh, we had said that we were going to have a YouTube follow-up video discussing more practical tips for overcoming the addiction and addressing it within your home. Um... A whole lot happened last week. Uh, I was still getting over my sickness that my uh, I and my whole family had. Then, as right as I was getting healthy, Joe uh, and his wife had their brand new baby girl, uh, and so of course they were there in the hospital for a couple days, couldn't record. And then uh, Will uh, took off for a speaking engagement and now a camp, and so we have yet to be able to uh, record that Think Fast video. And so uh, we promise that is still coming. At some point in the next few weeks, uh, we will have that resource available uh, because we we receive some great feedback. Uh, We know a lot of people are dealing with the issue of pornography addiction in their home, and so we want to make that available to you, so keep an eye out for that. We will let you know on the podcast once that is posted to our YouTube, but uh, as for this week, we're going to go in a different direction, and so let's get into the episode. So for this week, we wanted to look at baptism. We wanted to look at the myths about baptism, there's a, a lot of teaching about baptism that gets a lot of things wrong. And uh, this is something, of course, in the Churches of Christ we're well familiar with. Uh, we, baptism is kind of the thing we debate the most. It's one of the things that differentiates our, ourselves from, from everybody else in a lot of ways. And so we talk about it a lot, but there's some, some myths that we feel like need to be busted. Myths outside the Churches of Christ, myths inside the Churches of Christ. And so... That's the angle we wanted to go with this week. We have a, a few of them lined up, and so let's go ahead and get to that first myth on our list. And when we say myths about baptism, um, uh, false teachings in, in a sense, things that, that aren't true about the Bible, but things that are so widely held that a lot of people will just throw it out without really asking about it. And so the first one of those is that you get saved before your baptism. You get saved before you're baptized, and then you go and get baptized later to show that you've been saved. You've heard the term, uh, an outward sign of an inward grace. That is a myth. Myth. I'll let you guys go ahead and, and start telling us why. Yeah, the this is very common. I specifically think in Baptist circles, some of the men that, to be honest, you read some of their stuff. Of course, you know, they're not Church of Christ, so you take everything with a grain of salt they do have some fairly compelling arguments on a lot of things. This is just one of those. I think that they miss the mark. Uh, a lot of people miss the mark on this one in thinking that it's um, again, the outward sign of an inward grace. And one of the reasons we're going to look at a lot of different passages, I think for baptism uh, in this episode, um, one of those that we will continually come back to just to prep everybody, I think is Romans six. To me, this is the, the, like end all be all passage for baptism. I know first Peter three twenty one, Acts two thirty eight. There's a lot of great ones. Romans six is such a good one because it shows the necessity of baptism. Um, that that is part of the death and burial and the resurrection of us coming out of that water. And the outward sign of an inward grace takes this idea of, well, you know, you go back to Romans four and they think that it's not baptism that saves you. It's faith that saves you. Um, and baptism is just something that kind of follows after. Yeah, yeah, maybe they call it necessary, whatever they say. Sometimes it's to be added to the church, right? To show that the faith that saved you, you do have that faith, you're going to be baptized. Um, there are, again, some compelling arguments maybe around that. One of those is going to Romans 4, recognizing or looking at um, Abraham and circumcision. And so just to kind of kick that one around, fellas, and I'll open it up to you, Will. Um what are your thoughts on maybe Romans four, but also this outward sign of an inward grace? Well, I'll tell a quick story real quick because the, uh, the biggest interaction that I've had with individuals, we, me and another guy were, were studying with some ministers from the church of God, uh, ch- just a random church of God down here and, uh, close to Decatur, Alabama. And this was really the main point of our study. And it, you know, it was, it was cool. Kudos to them for actually being willing to sit down and, and study, but that's what we did. We opened the Bible and, Of course, our position is that a person is not, you know, and what we believe the New Testament teaches, not just our opinion, it's what we believe the New Testament teaches, is that a person is not saved uh, until baptism. And, you know, Joe, you just referenced Romans 6 as the, the, you know, it's a replication of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. 
And of course, for the individuals that we were studying with, these two ministers, their position was that that was not the case. And they, one of them even uh, brought to, as an example, the table, uh, a young person in their church that had made the decision to quote unquote, get saved. Um, but because the water wasn't heated in the baptistry, they said, you know, we, we put off the baptism for two or three weeks, but man, we were just so excited that she was saved. And that just got me thinking like, that's, that's really the position that a lot of these people have is, is kind of like what you guys just said, that it's something that can come later. It's something that is not urgent. It's something that the, the faith and the belief, if that is present, then salvation is, it has already taken place. If a young person confesses belief and has acknowledged that they are, um, you know, somebody who wants to follow Christ, then they are saved. And again, as somebody who grew up in the church, that's something that I had, you know, heard that people believe, but until I'd actually sat down and studied it with somebody who genuinely believed that it was, it was just kind of eye opening to me, like, wow, that's actually what these people believe. But uh, to answer your question directly, Joe, we're going to get into the, the circumcision thing a little bit later. I don't want to get uh, jump in on that too quickly yet, but uh, we go to Romans six. Uh, the one that I always go to is you look at the new Testament, you look at the book of Acts specifically, the places where we see baptism, is it done later? Is it done, you know, down the road, a few weeks, a few days later? No, that's not the case. You look at Acts 8, Ethiopian eunuch. When was he baptized? As soon as he passed water. You know, he came to water and said, hey, what's stopping me? Philippian jailer, Acts 16. Did they wait until the prime circumstances? No, it was, it happened that night. And so you see this urgency throughout the book of Acts, you see this urgency throughout the New Testament that, again, to me, this position of, well, you, you, you're, you're technically saved before baptism. It, it can't answer for that urgency. What would you guys say? To, how would y'all respond to that? Because that's the one that when I'm teaching young people you know, and say, hey, this is how you defend what we believe, that's where I normally go is look how urgent, look, look how eager these individuals were to get baptized. It was not something that they were willing to put off. Well, yeah, it shows there's to think about, you know, some young people. I know people that, as you were telling that story, it was making me think about, um, I had a good friend who was going to get baptized, but he really wanted his grandpa to see who was in a different state. And so it was going to be about a month out. And he's like, well, we'll just wait until then. So we have a lot of people planning their baptism kind of as a, it is a celebration, no doubt, but they want to celebrate with all the right people, make sure everybody's able to be there. Um, you're making the exact point perfectly. That's not what we see in Acts. That's not really where, what we see in any of the scriptures, specifically speaking of baptism. You see Acts 2.38, right? He preaches to them, repent and be baptized. Right after that, 3,000 souls are added. So that urgency would seem to indicate that this was not an outward sign of an inward grace that, well, their belief, and then, yeah, we'll kind of get around to the baptism later. That was not a celebration of, we'll make sure grandpa's there. Let's Let's make sure grandma's there, that everybody can be there. It's like, hey, what prevents me from from being baptized? This needs to take place immediately so as to be added uh, to the Lord's body, right? To be buried and resurrected with Christ. Um, so that urgency, I think, is a, a such a key point when discussing the outward sign of inward grace, specifically as you deal with, to me, it's more of a younger person thing of putting off that baptism, scheduling their baptisms out, right? Scheduling it for camp, the Sunday of camp or um you know, just to make sure that everything is perfectly right or that the water's right, whatever it may be. I think there's a lot of things, a lot of kind of excuses along the way that may delay baptism. And we can sometimes trick ourselves into thinking, well, that's normal. That's okay. We'll get around to it. Not what we see in Acts. That that was not their position. Um, Ethiopian unit getting off on the side of the road. I mean, it's like, well, why don't we just get back to a nice pool? Right. Okay. Something like well, that. I'm going to throw in the thing that, that has to be mentioned as part of this of the idea of you get saved before baptism, you can almost say it with me. What about the thief on the cross? <laughs> mm. right, I mean, right. and, that and is, on that the is one the hand, yeah. I think we have a, a very good answers for that. On the other, fair enough. It, it makes sense why people would ask that, that Jesus tells sure. a man, you're going to be with me in paradise. And we can say, well, that man clearly wasn't baptized. So there, there's your, your case. So I, I, I obviously have arguments I would make against it, but I want to throw it to you guys first. Well, the, the chief one that I've heard is that um, it is very possible that he was baptized. And I, I don't know that I necessarily side with that opinion, but if you go back to, and I should have had the, the, the reference pulled up, I believe it's in Matthew when it's talking about John baptizing um, in Anon near, near Salem. Again, I think that is a uh, book of Matthew. Anyway, um, it talks about um, all those from Jerusalem came to be baptized. And so, and again, I'm not saying I sided with the argument, but it is an argument that has been made that, hey, 
Maybe he was baptized by John, again, a baptism of repentance, not the same baptism we're baptized with today. Um, and so that would explain that, yeah, you know, we don't know for sure that he wasn't baptized is essentially the argument uh, there. Well, Joe, what's the other one? Yeah. The argument I have heard is it's kind of like a rich man who has a will completely planned out. Hey, when I die, this is what you have to do in order to be part of the inheritance, right? Boom, boom, boom. He's got the list before he dies. He can hand out as much money as he wants. He can hand out whatever possession he wants. You can do this. You can do that here. I'm going to give this to you. He has every power and every right to do it. When he dies, his will is binding. And that's the the position I've heard is Christ has the ability to save anybody on the spot as we see multiple times. Why, why pick the thief on the cross? Their sins are forgiven. Right. Right. Why not pick Zacchaeus? Why not pick other people that we don't see getting baptized necessarily that, he does say your sins are forgiven. I, that happens all throughout because Christ has the ability to forgive sins. Once he dies, the only way to enter into the forgiveness of sins is passing through his blood uh, that had been shed on the cross and through his resurrection. So up until the resurrection, up until his death and resurrection, I think he had every right to hand out salvation to whoever because he's God. Because he has to now say, you the know, will is fine. Jesus, right. Yeah. Well, right. Now the will is that. Binding. Not only that, when we're telling people you need to get baptized and, and that baptism, you know, baptize, baptize for salvation, uh, baptism for the remission of your sins, those terms that we use, Romans 6, 3, and 4, what are we baptized into? Into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus told the thief on the cross that, and he was saved without baptism, what could he not possibly, possibly physically have done? Be baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, because it hadn't happened yet. And so... Right. Like, why are we holding ourselves to a standard of, but now that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus has happened, and we are to be buried, baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we don't have the same excuse he has. We don't have the same, we're not on the same timeline he was. The other well, thing, if Jesus is going to, if Jesus comes into your living room and says, today you'll be with me in paradise, okay, I then I'll if go that happens, <laughs> exactly, I will go with it. Don't worry about baptism if Jesus is going to be in your living room telling you that. I don't think that's going to happen. So, oh, and and the, what he has spoken to us is go get baptized. <laughs> so. Bingo. That's exactly the point. Like if if he speaks that to you, it's not it's it's apples and oranges for people that say, well, basically, I could be like the thief on the cross. Are you speaking to Jesus personally? No. Right. And real quick, just for those of you who might be wondering, the reference that I was talking about earlier is Matthew chapter three, verse five, uh, where it says, "Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins." So again, it's an argument. I'm not saying I be, I'm, I'm somebody that sides with it, but the argument does exist that hey, maybe he was baptized and then reverted back to to his old ways. But no, Jack's right. That that is the. Would y'all say that's the number one objection that's thrown out, or at least one of the the number one pieces of evidence that people use to try to say that baptism is not necessary? I would say it is. It's it's up, yeah. it's up there for sure. Yeah, I mean, the I thief also on the have... cross always comes out, and and as Joe said, it is a very popular thing. You see it on social media: the planned baptism, the baptism Sunday thing, where a church quote unquote converts a bunch of people over a series of months, and then has them all get baptized on the same day months later. Um, it, it, it as you said, it's very popular. It's a very widespread teaching. The other one that I've also heard getting into the Book of Acts, um, which I don't know that we had talked about this previously or or anything, um, but the idea of you know getting into well, we see baptism in the Book of Acts, but there's there's the Holy Spirit, and I've heard the case made that baptism is is it was essential for first Christians to get the physical spirit, the miraculous spirit. And then it wasn't after that. Do you guys have any thoughts on, on that? Once the miraculous spirit was not given, that baptism basically wasn't as essential. Any I thoughts on that? Somebody forgot to tell the church, I guess. I mean, like, <laughs> they kept on baptizing. And so well, um, well, look at Jesus's last words. What does he, you know, Matthew 28, what does he tell them to do? Go make disciples doing what? baptizing, baptizing and teaching, right, yeah. right. So, so the end of the earth that's where I, um that's where i would point yeah and uh you know i joe i think you were there a, a debate years ago there's a doctrine called mid-acts dispensationalism the mm. baptism was essentially for the jews and not for the gentiles and so in the middle of acts basically baptism stopped being necessary and as gentiles we don't need to be baptized it's a very convoluted have argument have they read acts 10 what well about cornelius uh, the, that's what they were saying, saying that's there yeah it hinges on that yeah and okay. literally in the debate the man said well peter was mistaken peter you know he got oh, caught up wow. in the moment and so it's like that's kind of where you end up on those things so anyway all of this is on the point of you get saved before your baptism and i've said this on the podcast 
people at Forney have heard it a million times. If you've read my stuff, you've probably read it a bunch of times. Bible verses, we need to know what they don't say, and we need to know what they do say. And that's really the, the key to this teaching, is what the Bible does say, what the purpose of baptism is. And when you don't understand the purpose of baptism, you can say things like, it's not necessary, or you get saved before you're baptized, the thief on the cross, all of these things. And so what really is the purpose of baptism, rather, beyond just you know, part of the steps of salvation, the point at which you're saved. Well, it's the washing away of your sins. It's calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. It's being uh, buried, you know, dying, buried, and raised with Jesus, Romans 6, Colossians 2. Um, it's it, it's essentially the point at which you leave your old life behind. You're dying to the flesh and, and taking on the spirit. And, and it's also the point at which you're signing your life over to God. You're saying, I'm dying. I, I quit. I'm laying my life down. I'm sacrificing myself on the altar of baptism to be joined in, in following in the, the life of Jesus. And when Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives. Baptism is the moment where that happens, where you died with him. And so... That's what happens at baptism, and I think a lot of people in the churches of Christ don't fully understand that either. We know it's part of the steps of salvation, we know it's important, but it's it's literally the moment at which you signed on the dotted line, my life doesn't belong to me anymore. Well, and I've I've made that point before, again, as somebody who works with young people, I've said that, you know, dozens of times on the podcast. We have a lot of young people who don't fully recognize that. You know, they they see it as something that, you know, that's just what you're expected to do. You know, you you you're just expected to get baptized. And yet sometimes, unfortunately, the only difference that you can see between a young person who was not baptized, then they get baptized. And then the only difference you see after that is that they now take the Lord's Supper. Their lives don't change their behavior. And again, not just young people there. There I'm sure some older people that do that, too. But especially for young people that have grown up in the church, we have not done a great job communicating. Oh, no, your life should change. You should look very different because you're committing to something. That's Ephesians uh, chapter four, putting on the new man, Colossians three. You're putting off all these old behaviors. You're literally becoming someone new. And that's, of course, the third element that you just hit at being raised with Christ. You're literally being raised a new man. All of it is, is uh, you know, shown, is symbolized in baptism. So you hit on an interesting point with the kids. And I want to take it to both sides because I want to get into infant baptism here in a bit. I think there's a lot of myths surrounding that. Before we do, though, I want to take it to the other end of the spectrum. This is a hot topic. I just want your, I don't think we're not going to solve it on this one, but I'm curious <laughs> your guys' thoughts on. Have a little faith, Joe. Yeah, yeah well, you know. We we'll solve see. all the, the world's age, problems. Of course. Most of the time, yeah. Um, the idea of the age of accountability. Will, you're talking, let, I'll, I'll be honest, I was baptized at 10 at the time. And I fill out forms and, you know, things like they had questionnaires just to make sure I was ready. Like, do you understand what you're doing here? Answered right. every question, right? I was raised in the church. I look back and I go, man, what were my sins? Did I understand the idea of dying to right. self? Do I think I need to be rebaptized? No, I've thought about it a lot, prayed about it. Um, I do think I understood the fundamental parts of, of Christ dying for my sins, my sins separating me from God. Did I understand though? what you guys are talking about, the seriousness of the life that comes after the being member, you know, a part of the church and helping in that area and, and just everything that comes with it. I won't go into it, but it makes me wonder. I also know a family that, you know, their age of accountability, they don't let their kids get baptized before 18 because they want to make sure their kids understand what they're called to and that they are old enough to, to like accurately and, and, honestly make the decision. Am I ready to be a disciple of Christ? What are your guys' thoughts on age of accountability and specifically on should there be a specific, like what would you tell a parent who maybe has a kid at nine or 10 years old that has grown up in the church and knows these things? What advice would you give? So this is um, so tough, first of all, tough question. And this is going to sound like 100% a cop-out type of answer. Oh, but it 100% it depends on, it, it's situational, in my sure. opinion. You can have two different nine-year-olds that are or 10-year-olds or whatever age that are at two completely different levels when it comes to their maturity, their faith, and their walk with God. Um, are there nine and 10-year-olds who understand what sin is and understand that they have sin in their lives? I would say, yeah, but you know, I'm not going to say that there's not. Are there also a bunch of nine-year-olds that don't really know what sin is, don't really understand the wrath of God and don't understand that Jesus died to shield you from the wrath of God. Yeah. I think there's a lot of nine, 10 year olds that don't understand that either. And so you say, what advice would you give parents again, not to have a cop-out answer, but 
it, it depends on the kid. It truly does. I'm, I'm similar to you, Joe. I was baptized at 11. So one year after you, I've gone back and thought about it before. Um, but I think it, it largely speaks to my point that I initially made and that we have to make sure no matter what age the kid is, 10, 16, I certainly would not subscribe to the belief that they have to be 18 minimum or anything like that. But you need to make sure they understand what did Jesus die for? What is he saving you from? And now what is your life going to look like afterwards? And so, again, depends on the kid, uh, in my opinion. Jack, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, so I'll, I've got an article um, that I'll, I'll link on the show notes page um, that I wrote on Age of Accountability a while back. Is there back. anything you don't have an article for? I when, was just wondering. thinking that he links to one or two every time. Like, we just tee these things up for him. Well, I mean, when you've been writing every week for 10 years, that's 500 plus articles. So there's got to be something true, somewhere. True. You run out Good of stuff. Point. There's there's Good a lot point. of doubled up. Um, uh, but I, I, when I wrote on it, this is a point I'm going to push into our, our next point as well. So I'm not going to hit on it fully here. That there is an expectation of growth and contribution and service and, right. and all that of every Christian. And if a kid is not going to be ready for that for 15 years after baptism or 10 years or, or even five years after baptism. Then what's the point of baptism? Uh, yeah, are right. they ready? Sure. You know, the walk. But when you talked about like, well, I didn't understand. I don't think anybody, I don't think no matter what age you are, you're going to fully understand what you're getting yourself into. You're going to fully you're understand the to, journey, yeah. the complexity, the depth of the new life, right? And and just how much it's going to change your life. And so I don't think that's a fair thing to hold against children. But on the other hand, I don't know. I mean, there's, uh, you got to know, you got to know something. But again, a five-year-old can recite the steps of salvation. A five-year-old sure. can give you, you know, like little kids can give you the, the basics, but do they get it? Do they get well, and- what they're signing up for? And just from a personal point of view, obviously, you know, my, my child right now is three months old. I'm nowhere near that place where my kid might be coming to me at eight or nine and saying, hey, I'm thinking about being baptized. Uh, you know, obviously, y'all's kids are still young as well. So, you know, I certainly sympathize with, with parents who are really kind of caught in those crosshairs and caught in the middle ground of, eh, I don't really know. And of course, some go with the better to be safe than sorry point of view. So it's tough. It, it truly is tough. So I want to take that exact idea better to be safe than sorry. I think a lot of people look at that and they, you know, if their kid's young, it's like, well, I'd rather have them baptized than have them, you know, wait for a few years. They talk themselves out of it and they never get baptized. So might as well just baptize them young. Okay. So if we take that argument out to the fullest extent, let's get into the idea of infant baptism. This is huge in denominations. And this is our next myth that we're discussing, right? right. And yes. So So exactly. Number one is you get saved before baptism. Number two is that infants, that little children need to be baptized. So exactly. That's, that's myth number two. Um, is, you know, you infant baptism, you're, it would be better, better safe than sorry, right. To have your kid be baptized. And if we're going to play out your point, well, to the logical, that, that point to its logical conclusion, then we would say theoretically logical conclusion, right? We would say that if it's better to be safe than sorry, if you're supposed to train up a child in the way he should go, why not start at a young age? Why not start right. at the very beginning in kind of this? And, and you'll hear like this covenant idea, you know, it's the covenant passed down through the generations, even carrying on some of the patriarchy and such that it's better for a baby to be baptized, an infant to be, to be baptized, um, to show them the way and to make sure that from a young age, they kind of understand what we do in, in our family as following Christ. What are your guys' thoughts on that? What would you say? Um, obviously, we in the church don't believe in infant baptism. What are your thoughts on that, though? Well, uh, Jack, I'll get to you here in just a second. But I'll, let me go back to kind of the that phrase that you threw out there, Joe, with age of accountability. Um, that is not a phrase that we see in the Bible. That's not a phrase we see in the New Testament. That's just kind of a phrase that we have um, you know, formulated to kind of just – illustrate something that I think needs to be illustrated. And that is the question, at what age are you accountable for your sins? And of course, with what we believe the New Testament teaches about baptism, with baptism literally coming into contact with the blood of Christ, for what purpose? To wash your sins away. And so that's the ultimate question when we're talking about infant baptism, is what sins, you talk about a three month, my, my, my son is, is about to turn four months old. What sins are, is he accountable of? You know, if we were to baptize him as an infant, you know, again, as whether it be the covenant form or whatever it is, uh, whatever argument that people want to throw out there, we believe the New Testament teaches that the purpose of baptism is to have your sins washed away. It's Acts 22, 16, wash your sins away. Are there any sins that infants are guilty of? 
that 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 is the the position that I would hold whenever this topic comes up is, you know, we just talked about how some eight or nine year olds can't really truly understand what sin is and what their sins do to God. Can we really expect a four month old to do it? Um, so what would you guys add to that, Jack? I, again, that's kind of the main crux of the matter to me. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, deeper things we could go into there. What do you think, Jack? I think you're on the right track. I think it's important to steel man other people's arguments. If, if you're familiar with the term, so to yeah, straw you make man it the people's arguments is possible. Can yeah, yeah, straw man is to make an argument they're not really making and beat it up because it's really easy. Steel man is let's make the argument that they're making. Like really make one that they would sign off on and say I'm okay with that. Right. That represents my position well. And so that's part of it. Is the original sin you're born in sin? That's that's one view on why infants are baptized. Um, I don't think that's the main thing, though. We were talking a little bit about this off air. A lot of times it's the covenant thing, right? Of Abraham circumcised his kids. You know, from the beginning, it was a covenant that was passed on from families to families. And and if you are a child of God, if you're in the family of God, if you're a Christian, your children are to be too. They're part of that covenant with God as well. And so you've got those two sides of it. Is, is a kid born in sin? Do they have sin to repent of? But then you've got the other reason people baptized infants or baptize infants is to say, this is my child. I'm a Christian. They're going to be a Christian as well. I'm going to do that as well. And on the one hand, you know, we can say, well, that's not a decision you can make for your kid. And they would say, well, Abraham made it for Isaac and Isaac for Jacob and, and so on and so forth. And so those are the arguments we, we really have Does to wrestle with. Does that not... With. Does that not make it more of a symbol, though? More of a, you know, ritualistic act would be in, my question. In a sense, and I think that goes hand in hand with our previous one of right. that, it, it, that a lot of people think it is a symbol. Uh, a lot of people sure. think it's something yeah. not a, a choice that you make and is the point at which you enter into salvation in the blood of Christ. And so with that being the case, let's, let's kind of take it from those different angles. Uh, Joe, you had something to say? I was going to say, would you get baptized the second time? Get baptized as a kid for the covenant aspect of it, and then get baptized so as to remove sins under these in, in under this idea, if we're going to use their principles, would that mean you need to get baptized the second time? I don't think they take it that way, but then it purely stays a symbol and theoretical right. kind of, which... I, I think there's plenty of scriptures that show that's not the case. So I would almost be more okay with their argument if they believed in two separate baptisms, one to kind of show the covenant, right. of, hey, we're still in this. The second aspect is God told them to circumcise on the eighth day. There's a command to that because it makes a lot of sense, even from a biological perspective with vitamin K and, and everything medical else. Medical perspective, so, sure. Yeah. Yeah. From a medical perspective, it makes more sense. We don't see God ever commanding anything regarding infant baptism. Um, so there's that. The other thing that I would add, though, though, to their strong, you know, the steel man argument is they would look at, and I don't even think this is a steel man. I think this is fairly easy to get past, but they would look at like the Philippian jailer, his entire family getting baptized. And this takes place a couple times in scripture. Would Where it you not, see the phrase, his whole household or something. Right? Correct. Yeah. Would it not logically follow? There could be kids and maybe even infants in that, that, you know, maybe he, they might be baptized as part of that. Well, and so again, talk about steel man in the argument. I don't think you can, and I know there are a lot of people that do, but I, I don't see how anybody can truly read uh, Romans 6, uh, again, go through Acts, and, and come away thinking that baptism is just a symbol. Uh, again, I, I don't see how anybody does that. And so if you take that argument off the table, you are now purely stuck with what Joe's uh, point just now is, is that, okay, if it's not a symbol, if it's not something that is just you know a representation, then you get baptized when you're an infant you know, for the covenant, uh, from the covenant perspective, it should logically follow. Then you get baptized again after that for, you know, later on for the purpose of washing your sins away. I'm going to defer to you too, because I'm not as familiar with this point of view when it comes to the covenant side of things. But again, that would be my logical conclusion is you, you almost, if you're going to support this idea, you almost have to say it's more of a symbol. It's more of just something that you do, which again, I don't see how anybody can get that from reading the rest of the new Testament. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and that really is, I, I don't want to, like, map our understanding and meaning of baptism, which I think is the biblical one, onto their arguments, you know, because, sure. you know, they, they do think it's a symbol, I believe. Um, so what they would say is, you got verses like 1 Corinthians 10, that all of Israel, youngest to oldest, went through the Red Sea, and it says they were baptized in the sea. 
Um, and so that covenantally, as they came out of Egypt to be in covenant with God, to be God's people, all of them did it at once, and it calls it their baptism. And so our baptism is your whole family coming out of sin, coming into covenant with God, uh, coming into that relationship. And so you can kind of see what they're going for there. Um, you guys sure. brought up the, the household thing, the Philippian jailer, his whole household. You can see what they're going for there as well. Um, they would point to Acts 2.39, you know, churches of Christ. I mean, I think that's like the first mem- verse churches of Christ memorizes Acts 238, right? Yeah. But the next one so. is the promises for all those who are fall off, or far off, as many as uh, he will call himself to your children and to, you know, I, I just butchered that. I quoted it backwards. But, you know, the, the promises for you and for your children is part of it. And so they would view that terminology is very similar to Old Testament terminology of God saying this is, you're, you're my people and your children will be my people and, and so on and so forth. And so... I can see what they're going for there. I can see where they're going with that. Um, let's take these one at a time. The whole Philippian jailer's household and the households being baptized in Acts. Um, you're working on assumption there. And when we right. talked about the thief on the cross earlier and the mention that uh, all of Jerusalem and Judea went out to John to be baptized. All of them, you know... It's a bit of a jump. Everybody, sure. right. yeah, I think it's a little bit of... Uh, you know, hyperbole there. Um, and so that's why it's, that's not my favorite argument for the thief on the cross is because you're just making an assumption. And so you're making an assumption with the Philippian jailer as well as if he had a two month old son, well, that he would be included. Well, maybe, maybe not. And, and so to assume that is, is a jump that you're making. And so what I would say in that argument is use the principles you find throughout the rest of the scriptures and then put them into this one rather than making an assumption, see how they fit. And throughout the rest of the scriptures, you see people making a conscious acknowledgement of their sin, repenting of that sin, putting their faith in Christ, and getting baptized. Why would that not be what happens with the jailer and his household? You know, because because children can't do that, right? And so I don't think the, uh, arguing from the silence, arguing from uh, an inference that we're making on that to say, well, there were there probably were kids. Who knows? And so that's not a good argument there. Let's get to the... Uh, other ones, maybe the better ones, the covenant, the covenant of Abraham, the covenant of, of the baptism in the Red Sea and and those kinds of things where people say, I'm a Christian. I I want my kids to be Christian. Uh, this is what our family does. This is the covenant that I've, I've made. As for me and my house, will serve the Lord. And so I'm going to dedicate my children to God through baptism. I mean, you're rolling if you want to just continue. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're handling yeah. it so well. Um. I mean, I, I can take it unless you want to just keep rolling because I think you're not going to want off the Okay, board. well, introduce, because you, you had more on this before we, we sat down and we were going over our notes, on the circumcision parallel that people use here. Sure. So the idea is, and you'll see, we'll get into Romans 4 in a little bit, but, you know, circumcision kind of being a, a big aspect of faith, right? Um, this is something that was going to be, It was part of the patriarchal generation, right? It was part of of Abraham showing that it was a a cleanness. And so you would be known as a pure, clean individual um, based on your circumcision, how they know those things. I'm not fully sure back then, obviously they, you know, they would understand who's circumcised and who's not. So with that being the case, you're going to show once again, that ceremonial uncleanness or, or ceremonial cleansing, I guess I could say, or should say. And so the idea would be from a young, you know, for your kid, it's a ceremonial cleansing. You're putting baptism and and circumcision on the same. The issue with that is circumcision is a very physical thing. It is strictly for males. So it's not, I I think theoretically there is circumcision for women. That's not what's called for in scripture. It is a, it is a male thing only. Well, salvation is for and baptism would be for everybody, right? Not just the males only. So are you dedicating the women to the Lord? It's not an apples to apples comparison. I don't think when you have the circumcision idea and the cleansing uh, from a very young age, the second idea is the cleansing was intended to be shown on a physical level, a covenantial level uh, throughout. It goes back to your point, Will, of what are you cleansing the kid from on a ceremonial level? Um, You would have to stick to it would make a great episode. Let's be honest to do a, 
a, a tulip way to not. I mean, I think that'd be fantastic. Maybe we should have somebody on that could help us with break down the Calvinist idea. And we'd want to steal man those as well and show as strong as they are, because there's some intriguing parts to Calvinism. Um, not that I don't think it's correct, but just some arguments that I think would be good to break down this being one of them of original sin, that, that infants are born, born with in sin, sin right. born in sin due to the sin of Adam. They're looking at Romans five sin entering into the world through one man. It comes down and it passes to us all. And so instead of more of a sinful nature, one that is inclined towards sin, they say you have sin you need to get rid of. This poses some issues because if you ask them, well, what about abortion? Are those kids going to heaven or going to hell? They really don't know. They, they right. hope and pray that they're going to heaven, but it's like, well, they have sin that has not been baptized and washed clean. They have not been cleansed. Uh, what do you do with that? They really don't know how to handle those type of arguments uh, from what I've seen. And I've, I've listened and watched some of the best stuff, you know, some of the top end Calvinists try to wrestle with those questions. This is not to get off topic, but all to say, if you're going to make the case that it's, it's going to track with circumcision and then an infant needs to, for a covenant side, then you do have to stick, in my opinion, you have to stick with original sin, which has holes in it. Um, again, we'll spend maybe another podcast on on just that alone. We could. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like I'm going on and on. Maybe I'm answering it. Maybe I'm not. Fellas, what are your thoughts? Will, I'll open it up to you, I guess, first. Um, what would you add or maybe change to what I said? Well, Joe, you brought up Romans 4. Uh, let's just go ahead and, and uh, get into that. If anybody is listening and has access to a Bible, I'm going to read just real quick because this this is where uh, proponents of this idea are typically. Uh, that is the idea of circumcision and baptism uh, being equivalent from Old Test from Old Covenant to New Covenant. This is where, or at least one of the spots they're going to pull from. So Romans chapter four verse nine. I'll start reading there. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And of course, that's Paul writing to the Romans. And so the again, the proponents of this idea will use that to say, you know, Paul here is teaching that Abraham was it was 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 credited or was accounted to him for righteousness at what point? It was before circumcision. The faith what was was what was most important. They will then take that and they will make an equivalency, which as Joe's already covered and what I agree with as well, what I believe to be a, a, an incorrect equivalency, a, 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 a what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, inadequate equivalency there to baptism. And they'll say the faith is the most important thing. You are saved before baptism. It's accounted to you for righteousness before baptism, just as it was with Abraham. Again, that's the position, and this is where they'll typically go uh, in order to make that, uh, again, in order to have that position, to, to believe that position. Jack, I'll kick it to you. What's, our, what's your response? You know, if somebody comes to you and points to these two verses and says, hey, take a look, according to Paul, for Abraham, it was the faith that was the most important thing that preceded circumcision, and that was what saved him and what uh, was, again, accounted to him for righteousness. What about us today? Baptism, is that not the exact same thing? Right. So, I mean, the Bible, you can't get around that it does make an analogy between circumcision and baptism. Colossians uh, Colossians 2 talks about that, of it, it was the circumcision we received. It was a circumcision not of the flesh, but of the removal of the fleshly body, you know, the, the, sure. the body of sin and baptism and all that. And so it, it is part of it. it. It's an analogy we have to understand, but that is also something we have to understand about analogies. They end somewhere. If they didn't end somewhere, it wouldn't be an analogy. It would be the exact same thing. And so with sure. Abraham, with, with Romans 4, what it's talking about here is that it was Abraham's faith that saved. Uh, and this is where, where you really pair Romans 4 and James 2. And, you know, there's, there's so much history of people understanding them against each other. And Martin Luther famously thinking, well, we just need to toss James out because it doesn't fit. James is saying faith without works is dead. And, and that, you know, faith with works saves. Whereas Romans 4 is saying it's not your work that you can, you know, it, it's not you. It's not that you deserve it. It's that faith did it for you. And what James is saying is not contradictory. What James is saying is the reason you know Abraham had faith was because it worked. The reason we know, uh, and, and what Romans is saying is Abraham's faith was the thing that mattered. And James is like, yeah, it was. And this is how we know he had faith, had faith had, how it came out. It was, um, you know, the, the proof of his faith. And so 
Um, it goes back to our discussion of, of producing fruit from a couple right. episodes ago. Your faith yeah. is going to produce results, is going to produce fruit. It's a byproduct of it. Right. And and James, when he says faith without works is dead, is he saying, look, if, if it doesn't do that, if it didn't lead Abraham to get up and go, then he, it's dead. He didn't it, have, it's not, there. It's yeah, not it didn't faith have, to begin yeah, with. It's, it's not faith to begin with. Right. What... Uh, and really they're using works differently. James is using works as obedience that you do as a result of your faith. Romans, Paul is using works to say things that you do rather than having faith, trying to justify yourself, trying to earn your way to salvation. And so circumcision, the point he's saying is circumcision wasn't something that Abraham said, I'm going to do this to get myself saved. It was, I'm already chosen by God. I've already put my faith in him. I'm going to leave my home. I'm going to do all these things. If he tells me to get circumcised, cool, I'm going to do that. Faith. Faith is what led to the work. And so when we talk about baptism, I've said before, I am a proponent of salvation by faith alone if we define it properly. Because reading our Bible, you know, we we, we have the steps of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and then people attack on live faithfully. What of that is not faith? You repent because faith. My sin is bad and I don't want it anymore. You confess Jesus because of faith. I really believe that he's Lord. I believe he walked out of the grave. I believe he's coming back. That's faith. I get baptized because he told me to get in the water. That's faith. It's all under the, the heading of faith. And so that really is the difference we're getting at with baptism circumcision. I just took a really long route to get there is it is an act of faith. Abraham's circumcision was an act of faith that he took on for himself, but when he had Isaac and then he had his children and their children's children and then and to you know the generations to infinity and beyond, the faith just kept building and building uh, from one to the next. Not Isaac had faith and so he got circumcised. Well, the New Testament doesn't show that you have faith and baptize somebody else. New Testament shows you have faith so you get baptized. That would right. be the big difference here between the two. We don't see anybody baptizing somebody else because of their own faith in the New Testament. You do see throughout the New Testament or the Old Testament people circumcising their children through their own faith. And so that would be the big difference in the analogy is who is it for, who is it done by and whom is it done to? Does that if make sense? On, yeah, I think so. If it's passing on the covenant, you know, in the Old Testament, it's passing on that cleansing of hey, this is what we do as a family. Baptism is an individualized thing. You are baptized into a church, into a new family, um, no doubt, but it's also something that each person has to make a choice for, I think is really kind of the point you're coming down to is, you know, and this is where in marrying these two ideas with with Romans and, and the faith saving us, the interesting thing is that these same people will use these arguments for infant baptism that, okay, it's the faith that saves you. And then the baptism comes out, we're sending more grace. I don't think you can believe that in infant baptism at the same time because the kid can't possibly can have, faith. have faith. Right. Correct. How can and, it possibly And again, have faith? it's it's a dedication. It's a yeah. I'm a Christian, so my, my kid like and, you said the parent has You're faith. saying it is more symbolic. And it's very much based on baptism. predestination. I'm a Christian because God predestined me to be one, so I'm gonna take on faith that God has predestined my child to be one. So I'm just gonna work on the assumption that my kid's gonna be a Christian, so let's go ahead and get this process started. Um, Better safe than sorry, right? Going back to the, kind of what started this. But I think it's good to move in. Sorry, Jack, unless you no, had something else. No, that's all. I, I think it's good to move into our myth number three, Jack, if you want to introduce that one, because I think you you can lead well into this. We've already started into this, I think. Right. And it's funny how these all blend and interconnect so well. So the first being that um, you're saved before baptism, and then you go get saved as uh, or you get baptized as a show of your salvation. Second being that infants need baptism. And, and that it's a circumcision, that it's all those things involved. Number three is baptism is a work. That's one of the things you will always hear is when you say we need baptism for salvation. Well, no, we're not saved by works. They'll point and, to Ephesians 2. Yeah, right. Ephesians 2. Uh, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 of uh, you're saved by faith through grace, grace through faith, sorry, no, not, not, uh, not of works. Yeah, so that right. you can boast. Uh, and then it says you're created in him for good works. And so... That is the first argument that comes out, is that baptism is a work and we're not saved by works. Again, as I just pointed out with James 2, Romans 4, we have to use these terms the way the Bible uses them. And when somebody says that, they're not using it the way that Paul was using it. They're not using it the way that James was using it. The way the Bible uses works is meritorious works. Things that you're doing, as we spoke of on our grace episode that you can hold up before God and say, look what I did. I deserve to be saved. 
If if right. if that's why, and and I should say this to Church of Christ members, if that's why you got baptized so that you can point to God and say, "Look at me, I did I did good." Then it is you're trying to be meritorious. Problem, if sure. if you did it because yeah. it's faith, Jesus told me to do it, so that's what I do. You know uh, that as I said earlier, it's signing your life over to Him. It's it's you know the, making sure everybody knows and and making sure you know. My life belongs to him. His name is written on my boot, you know. Um, all of these things that we do to signify and, and, and enter into that covenant with Jesus. So what we have to understand is the way the Bible uses works and the way people use works when they are challenging baptism are just light years apart. Taking it back as we have continued to, uh, to Romans 4, it's interesting that so many people get caught up on the Romans four side of it. They get caught up on Ephesians two and Jack, you made the point earlier of making sure that we know what a text does say, not just what it doesn't say. Um, and I think Ephesians two, eight and nine is a perfect one for that of the point that he's trying to make bringing Gentiles into the fold there. He's about to get into from that. Um, but also the Jews at the beginning of, Hey, we were all dead in our sins. It's grace that saves us. We have no way to save ourselves, but it's easy to champion Romans four without going to Romans six, which the idea of it being a work, I think, is just dispelled once again in Romans 6. This is why I think it is the champion argument for baptism. Uh, and I'm just going to start. I'll read just the first few verses of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. As you read through that, what part of that looks like a work to you? Because if you're going to say baptism is a work, you also have to say belief is a work. You have to say yep. repentance is a work. You have Fashion to go along. Yeah, exactly. Every last step, which, you know, whether we fully agree with how that all plays out, I think some of those get melded together. All of those are aspects of salvation. And if you're going to throw baptism under the bus, kind of as the, the work there, uh, I think you look at Romans six and you say, well, goodness, if that's a work, then it looks like we are saved from work, which is antithetical to the rest well, of Romans. Well, when you look at Ephesians 2, you have to, again, we talked in our last episode about how people just rip verses out of context. So they'll they'll do the same thing with this, verses 8 and 9. You have to start at verse 1 of Ephesians 2, and of course, even back even further if you'd like, but where Paul is literally setting up with the Ephesians and, and, and showing them and telling them, you were as good as dead. You were dead men walking. You had no way out. You know, you were dead in your sins, but it was God who raised you. The emphasis is on God. The emphasis is on the fact that there's literally nothing you could do to earn your salvation. Again, like Jack said, in a meritorious way. So the emphasis there is on God. And again, at the end of verse 10, we are created uh, or God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, those good works that we were created for. If you're going to, like you just said, Joe, I don't want to necessarily repeat it, but if you're going to make the jump and say, oh, well, baptism, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about a work. Then you you have to make the same jump and say, well, then belief is a work and repentance is a work and confession is a work. Again, that's that's there's a difference in obedience to God with God giving us an, an outlet from our sin, from God telling us, here is your opportunity to become children of mine, to go from being enemies of mine to being children of mine with baptism being a part of that. If that's a work, then again, so is everything else. And, and that's the point that we're making here. And, and the, the reason that you can't, again, biblically accurately say it's the same. When we're talking about works and when James is talking about works, he's talking about it in the sense of, again, orphans you visit, cards you write, good deeds. Right. Right. Th things that, as Jack already said, you could present to God and say, look at all the good I did. The, the good outweighed my bad. Look at all the... You know, the Pharisee and the tax collector, I, I tithe twice a week. All these things that uh, we, could, we could bring on a platter before God. Baptism does not fall into that category, no matter how many times people want to, again, rip this first out of context. I think that it, 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 What's that? I know. I just said bullseye. Yeah, it is. It's well said. I think the thing that really trips people up is the physicality of baptism. Repentance is kind of a heart thing. It's an internal thing. Uh, faith, you know, is, is an internal thing. Baptism is your body going into water. You know, it's very visible. It's very outward. 
But repentance is very outward, really. You know, if, if you've got to give something up, if you've got to stop watching the things that you used to watch, if you've got to stop saying the things that you had, you, that you used to say, the language that you use, it, drinking or, or smoking the things that you used to, I mean, like all the things that you have to stop doing or start doing, the good works that you have to start doing, that's a very physical thing as well. That's part of your repentance. You know, that's part of the change that comes about in your life that, that without that, you're not saved. If there's no repentance, if there's no physical manifestation of the, the fruit, once again, uh, it, you know, and it's, I know they would say that's because you're saved, you do those things. Yeah, but if, if it doesn't happen, then you're not saved. And so with baptism, they look at that and they say, oh, it's so physical. It, it It's a work because it's something that you do. All of these things are things that you do. They're all part of, right. of the recipe of salvation. And so <clears throat> one of the things I want to address that I think people in the churches of Christ sometimes mess up is they get sucked into this trap. People say baptism is a work, therefore it's not necessary for the steps of salvation, it's not part of your salvation. And we'll say, well, James 2 says, faith without works is dead. When you do that, or when they point to Ephesians 2.10 and say, well, we were created in him for good works, you have accepted their framing. You right. have accepted the framing that baptism is a good deed that you're trying to do to be saved, and yes, we do need those. That's not it. And Will is exactly right. What James 2 is talking about is the good things that you do for others, the service, those acts that you do, that's the afterwards. That's that's something that, you know, is a result of your faith that's that shows your produced. faith. Yeah, sure. the fruit that's produced. Baptism is not the fruit that is produced. So let's get into, I think we've, I, I think we've exhausted that point enough or, or understood it enough, unless you guys have anything else to add. Um, but I think let's get into our last myth here. Uh, and that is... I don't know exactly how we want to say this, mainly that I think baptism, we can look at it. The, the myth number four um, is it's the end all be all of Christianity. We put it on the pedestal of like, this is it. This is the pinnacle. This is the thing we talk about all the time. Um, and, and no doubt it is incredibly important as we've seen. Um, it, it is, you know, what, brings about our salvation, the death and the resurrection. And it puts us in contact with Christ's blood, which we can be, you know, eternally grateful for. So it's, so baptism obviously is very important. We're saying that I, I don't want to downplay the importance of this, this act um, that's, that's bringing us into salvation at the same time. It is very easy as that fourth myth. It's very easy to make it the end. all be all of Christianity. Fellas, I'll, I'll open it up to you. What are your thoughts on that? Well, and this is one that I have uh, harped on before in, in preaching and teaching before, uh, just because growing up in the church, you know, as, as you guys did as well, that is, uh, you know, an element that you will hear 25 to 30 sermons on per year uh, is on baptism, you know, and, and the importance of it. And again, like you just said, Joe, it's incredibly important. We don't want to denigrate, denigrate that in any way, but to some extent, I think our over glorification of it can give off the wrong impression can give off the idea that, hey, once you've hit, like you just said, once you hit that goal, once you're immersed in water for bat, I mean, that's that's all we need to understand. And I think that's my biggest issue with it, is that we have a tendency in the Church of Christ to believe that if we understand baptism properly, then we don't need to do any further study, that that's the number one thing that we need to understand. We don't get into things like sanctification. We don't get into sure. any, any, any deeper topics because they're like, well, we've got baptism down. That's all we need to get down. And again, to me, that's the issue with it. Uh, of course, it's something that we need to study. It's something we need to make sure that we properly understand, but then move on. Let's get to some deeper things. Let's let's continue down, uh, continue to open up the scriptures. And again, not hear 35 sermons a year on something that we should hopefully already understand. I think a lot of times we preach and teach to maybe the 0.002% of people in our, in our audiences who aren't baptized rather than preaching and teaching to the, the 99% that are. Again, that's my issue with it is we tend to neglect some deeper things. We tend to neglect some other uh, elements of scripture because we just want to make sure we've got baptism right. And then that's, that's what we have to harp on. That's what we have to preach on and teach on over and over and over again. What do you guys have to add to that? I think, I think it's a, easy to pat ourselves on the back, Jack. You mentioned this before. Sorry, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And may, you may have been going here, but anytime you come out with an article on baptism, it gets a bazillion clicks because, I, and I'm not saying that's bad necessarily, but does it not seem like sometimes we get a little too self obsessed with patting ourselves on the back for the ways that we are right instead of looking at it and saying, man, we could improve in this way or that way. If you come out with one showing that baptism is important and the sinner's prayer is wrong, you'll get 
you know, hundreds Shares of, and reach hundreds of, and all those exactly. Things, yeah. And, and you come out with one that maybe is a little more difficult. Um, that's, that's more, um, I, I hate to say judgmental, like, you know, just, I guess controversial, maybe controversial. Yeah. Good, good word. Um, that's not going to go near as far. So yeah, we seem to be a little bit more obsessed on going back to what I would consider to be the elementary principles. Sorry, Jack, though, what were you going to say? You're right. I mean, those articles always create the most buzz, the most list, the most readership, the most clicks, the most everything, because it's what we want to read about. And I think there's a tribalism to it, right? And I've I've heard this from people who grew up in non-institutional churches that they talked all the time about their specific things, you know, not having a classroom or not having classes, not having a kitchen, not have, and that they it was just something that they talked about all the time because it's what made them point. different. To that point, we do right. the same thing with instrumental music. Right, what that's, what, that's exactly yeah. what I was going to get. It's baptism in the instrument and now women's roles to a degree. But, you know, especially against the denominational world, what makes us different? The, the most visible things are baptism for salvation and instrumental music. So we talk about that a lot. And, and every group is going to do that. We're going to talk about the things that set us apart. And the reason is it's like, well, this is why you're here and not over there. Right. And I get that. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, yeah, we know that. I, I really view it, or I'd illustrate it like, if you're going to sit down and play a game like Clue or something like that, the first time you sit down, you got to learn the rules. Either somebody's got to teach it to you, or you got to read the rules, and then you play. If you got the same group together the next time, and you sat down, and you read the rules, and played, and then the next time you sat down, and you read the rules, and you played, and then you said, you know, like... At a certain point, you know the rules. You don't rules. need to read the rules every yeah. time. Yeah, and when, when you bring somebody new in, you teach them the rules. When you bring when you evangelize to somebody, you teach them the rules. You teach them baptism. And then you play the game. You play the game of Christian life. You grow in your knowledge. You grow in your depth. You grow in your, your sanctification in, in all these ways, rather than just reading the rules again. And Hebrews 6 gets at this, where it, it talks about the meat and the milk growing from immature to mature. And he's criticizing the, the readers there, the listeners, possibly, of saying, you guys should be teaching now. You should be moving on. You should know things, and yet you're stuck on the elementary teachings. And one of the things that he lists is teachings about baptism. Teaching about, your, your version might say washings, some of them say, but the word literally is baptisms. Like, yeah, we got that. You understood it. Everyone who's a Christian in this room knows about baptism or else they wouldn't have gotten baptized. So why do we keep talking about it over and over and over? It's incredibly important but making that our bread and butter, our number one thing, the thing we talk about more than anything else, really hampers people and keeps everybody stuck in the first grade. This may be a soapbox issue, but I have a, I struggle with preachers who preach entire sermons on baptism. Will, you mentioned this. Who are we preaching to? This is to members of the church. If you want to go evangelize those who aren't members of the church, that's great. I'm not a big fan of, of invitations, to just be quite honest with you. Um, I don't think... That is how we go out and get people. Is you're talking to your entire. You're talking about making the worship service uh, an evangelistic thing to the outside. Correct. Exactly. Rather, yeah. Ex exactly. Like preaching an entire 30 minute sermon on baptism, the majority of people who are sitting there are not baptized. If you end up going into a church where that's not, go for it. That is great for your church, for your church of Christ. That you know the majority, probably 85, 90 percent of the people sitting there um, are baptized. I Why would, would we preach that, it? Most of the time. Yeah, truly. And and for those that aren't, I mean, maybe kids or whatever that aren't quite ready for that. Um, rarely are you going to have somebody sitting there, in my opinion, who from one sermon preached, that's when you need to be in that guy's life working on him throughout the week, right? Calling him, talking to him, uh, talking to him once uh, the worship service is over. But to tailor our worship services around the elementary principles, I, I don't know. I I. I don't think that's right. I think we should be preaching to our congregations about things other than what we've already done. Jack, was that reading the instructions for a game? Was that analogy original to you? Because that is genius. And I, I certainly don't want to call you a genius. Because Hey, is, I'll, I'll take the credit. I'll, I'll take the credit. Because <laughs> that, is, that is really good. And again, you think about uh, how often we do that again, especially not to keep harping on it, but with our young people. We, we've talked before about how shallow and to some extent non-existent our bible knowledge is these days this is a huge part of it uh it's because we hit the same stuff over over and over again we teach the same things we we preach acts 238 we preach mark 16 15 left and right to the point where again not saying they shouldn't be taught or that we should neglect it but how about we move on look like you guys just said why don't we get to, to some more some deeper some deeper things some some things that don't get discussed quite a bit. There's a lot of, of topics that our kids, again, to isolate the young people, want to know about. 
Why don't we talk about gender more often with the transgenderism things that are going on today? You know, why don't we talk about the, the biblical model for the home? Why don't we talk about these things? No, because sure. we're, we're too busy constantly preaching instrumental music or lack thereof uh, and, and baptism. And That's, so, I mean, even the Great Commission, baptize them, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Like, do the baptizing and then get into the teaching of how to follow. And right. I, I think one of the other things is baptism for us with the steps of salvation we've talked about, it becomes part of like a, you know, a little recital a little dance a little thing you got to remember and recite and it's almost like our magic words and you say these and you're saved and so baptism really just becomes part of an incantation almost that you go over and and all right i did this i heard believe repent confess be baptized live faithfully that's it i'm saved and like let's similar to as sorry i was just similar to the acts of worship thing that we do right you you know let's let's check our box make sure we have all five and then we're good to go we don't look any deeper and as as we talked about when we get into that the things we talked about earlier baptism what it is it's where you you know that your death burial and resurrection it's signing your life over it's where you receive the spirit and you begin this new walk with god and and crucified with christ and all of those things i think a lot of people don't even understand that i think it's well i repent and i did this and i'm saved and that's no, like our, our teaching could go even deeper on what baptism is, but also not just get stuck on baptism itself. Well, you had talked about some of the deeper teachings earlier of sanctification and things. I think baptism is the justification, just as if I'd never sinned, right? At at the baptism, you were justified. You were, your sins are washed clean. You're made as though you have never sinned. Sanctification is what comes comes next. That is the being made holy process. That's a lifelong pursuit that is done by the spirit living inside of you. If we don't ever get to that, then, and we only stick on the justification, we're missing a key aspect of Christianity. And that's why when we make it the end all be all, we fail to neglect, or we, we, um, fail, I guess, to focus on, and we, we do neglect the rest of life, which is most of the Christian walk. Like that is the beginning to the Christian walk, not the end of the Christian walk. And it's easy to say, okay, I've been forgiven my sins. Now I'm good to go. Well, are you being sanctified? Are your desires for the flesh turning into things, you know, desires for the spirit? Are you and putting the on the, the new spirit? man? Or, you know, Correct. You put off exactly. You, yeah. And, and, and putting on the new, there are things that will still, we know from Romans seven, we will still struggle sometimes with that sin, but Romans eight is all about the spirit. We come out of that. We are now slaves to righteousness based on the spirit. That's the sanctification process. That's where I choose to spend most of my study and most of my time and specifically in preaching is being made holy. That's where I think Christians need to start transitioning to. So with that, with that, I think, um, fellas, anything else you want to add? I think that pretty much sums up our discussion here. Yeah. So so to sum up the the myths that we hit, we hit four of them um, with some sub points uh, there, but myth number one, that you get saved before baptism. Uh, myth number two, uh, that infants uh, need to be baptized, young, young, uh, young children. Uh, third, the fact that it's a work, you know, as, as it speaks in James 2, just something else that we do to earn our salvation. And then myth number four, that it's the end all be all of Christianity. And I'm sure there are more that we could have gone into. Um, I would say, you know, we would obviously say those are kind of the main ones that get tossed around, as Jack stated earlier, by um, members uh of the church of Christ and then members outside that, you know, other denominations that will throw these things out there. So this, again, as I said earlier, this is an episode that um, hopefully you learned a thing or two, but we wanted to address because there are a lot of teachings about baptism that need to be set straight. Again, not according to our opinion, not according to what Will, Jack and Joe thinks, but according to what we believe the new Testament teaches, what God's word teaches, right. what, what Paul and Romans and all these other places uh, through the inspiration of God teaches. And so that was the, the point of emphasis behind this episode uh, when it comes to the myths about baptism. And if you have spotted different myths or you disagree with some of those things, let us know. Post in the comments on Facebook when we post this. Um, let us know through email, through through other social media. Um, we want to hear back from you. If you say, man, you guys missed a huge myth, let us know. We might be able to do a part two if there's if we come up with enough. Uh, if you disagree with some of these things, let us know. We would love to hear from you guys and maybe uh, even able to continue this discussion and work through some other things if, if there's uh, some discussion to be had there. So we realize this is not... Um, this is not everything that can be said on the topic of baptism. We just hope that it's been helpful in recognizing it is absolutely essential, but there are a lot of myths that go along with it. Jack, do you want to, um, I guess, do the outro here? Yep. Uh, so I want to make a request once again. If you're listening to the show, if you're enjoying the show, whatever podcast app you're getting it on, 
leave us a rating. Please uh, leave us a comment or a review, however you would like to do it. That helps other people find us. Uh, it's it's just good to see. We've had a couple. Always good to hear that people are listening and enjoying and learning something from the show. Kind of keeps us going. Uh, reminds even, us. Even even though Jack might get on your nerves at times, we would love five stars. Right, right. Don't, I mean, don't let don't exactly. let him stop you from giving. Don't do it let for me. Stuff. Yeah, don't let. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me cost you the star review. Uh, be nice to these guys for me. So, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, for my favorite deputies, I'm Jack Wilkie, and we will talk to you guys next week. <laughs>